Well, happy tabernacles out there. Yes, the annual feast. Uh, we're on the last great day. It's also called the day of fire. Praise Yahweh. I've seen great things get fulfilled on this day. And I tell you, uh, we did see, okay, the Jews in Israel and them are mostly all on a calendar that's about a day ahead of the biblical by visibility of the first crescent calendar, which sets the whole year, every year, about two days before the one where you just go by the black of the of the moon, which takes typically two days until you finally see the sliver, sometimes three. And the, the biblical calendar starts when you see that sliver. And it is uh, easy to... Um, there are a lot of websites that uh, display you the the updated uh, calculation. Even you can do it 10 years in advance. The biblicalcalendar.org is one uh, and, and so forth where you can get on the same calendar with us. Just, you know, set your calendar. You got next year, it's coming. The feast days are, you know, going to be not till next spring. So uh, I hope more and more people can join us on the same calendar. It's not a big deal. You just uh, set your calendar at the beginning of the year, like you do with any calendar, and set it and forget it. You won't even know the difference, except for that God did command that by the seeing of the lights. Okay, when you see it. And that is all throughout the scriptures, so you know the moon is, is when you see it. And somehow astronomers got kind of off base when they started dealing with NASA and stuff, just to say, okay, new moon has a new meaning, which, and also, so in the farmer's almanacs and things, they started calling the new moon just as when it starts to become black. So they don't even say like, okay, when it starts to show the sliver, which is a couple days later, when the new moon actually is starting to become visible. But actually when it's still the old moon, it's, it's still rotating out of the old moon. It's not even yet the new moon. Oh, praise Yahweh. Thanking, I'm thankful for everybody who does observe any moon, uh, whether it be a day off or even a full moon. Some people got the whole idea, all, all, all kinds of ideas. But I pray we all come into the unity of the faith. And I pray you'll come and pray uh, that same prayer with us. As it says, we will all come into the unity of the faith and be gathered together from the corners of the earth. Well, it is a big day uh, Quite a few Israelis have been killed out there in Palestine. Uh, you have, what is it, uh, I think it's nearing five, 6,000 wounded on the Israeli side uh, as tens of thousands of rockets were fired within the last 24 hours. And it is a big day. So we do have other prophecies fulfilled on the great day of fire day, for example, I was in Kiev, Ukraine, okay, celebrating this day, what was it, in 2013, and that was before there was any maiden or any of that, um, but it, that was the when it first started. The, actually, I was there praying uh, for repentance and nationalist restoration over there and for the true uh, house to be um, restored of the Kiev Rus, okay, not of whoever else you might think, but the Scythian, the real true Kiev Rus people of the royal house, okay, which is a noble house that gave us the French nobility, okay, that gave us the Carolingian emperors, okay. This is the royal house, and it came from, it's called Sicambria. So I was there. Okay, and that day that I was there, the first roadblocks were put up. I prayed with the Cossacks people. I did pray for the knights and so forth uh, and celebrated. Okay, um, so what happened that day, uh, that um, on this great day, was, hey, they put up roadblocks. They put up, they started occupying the old communist buildings, took them over. Um, it was a great uh, event. I didn't even know it all till I got home that that all happened, actually. So, called a coincidence, some do. But we were praying there, and it was, it was an answer to prayer. It's, it's prophetic. It really was prophetic about uh, all of that.
Now, okay, some people are saying Russia, Russia is the great salvation for us all and all of this kind of stuff. When they've been the biggest persecuting the churches. Okay, some will argue, oh, well, oh, but Ukraine, compare them to Ukraine. Yeah, you can compare that their corruption is so extreme, Ukraine compared to anywhere else. So I don't think that's a real comparison. Now, um, you know, the Bible does say that he will send his angels, the reapers, who will burn all the wicked. And they could be reapers, maybe, uh, who are going to burn all the, you know, all the tares, as it says, you know, before the rapture. It says the wicked are going to be burned up. It doesn't say that the righteous are all just going to disappear. No, it says first the wicked will be gathered and burned. And then after that, is that spiritually speaking, as it can also say it's talking about, Okay, of course, you could say it's talking about in the figurative sense, because these are parables, right? Uh, that it's the great wine press, uh, that uh, all the wicked get thrown into the great wine press, and for 200 miles, the blood will be up to the horse's bridle, and that's in a physical location. That's literally right there where all this stuff is happening. That's the Valley of Armageddon, and it is a physical geographical location. Uh, the Kidron Valley is another place, and it calls the Great Valley of Decision. There's a whole bunch of scriptures about it that makes you really know that it is indeed a physical location. And these scriptures are all listed in our article as Armageddon. Where is Armageddon is the name of the article. You can reach that article on our website, orthodoxchurch.nl or St. Andrew's OCC, whichever you prefer. It's also on Watchman News. We do keep an uh, archive there. So everybody can search their heart to their heart's content. Our categories aren't all set up is since we had a, a big blowing away of our site. And the search button works. But for some categories, you can't find it through just searching categories. And we have hundreds of articles that have to get totally re-indexed. And that would be, uh, you know, we're needing some help with that. So we do look for volunteers, but it's not always uh, top of the list for volunteering work. So, you know, it it works out in any case. We do have so many articles for people, and they are still. So also Google. We When our site got hacked, we not only lost our categories, because that's what they did. There's a Chinese hacker outfit that attacked and inserted code and actually... Destroyed. So we went from backup and restored it all. But what happened is Google started saying, okay, you guys got uh, a bad website, and that's what their, that was their mission accomplished. So that was the biggest thing. That plus what they did is they uh, destroyed our categories. So the categories were used also by Google, and so they all got flagged as... Uh, that's where they inserted some Chinese characters or something. So because our website has been number one uh, for fighting communism, um, that's probably why we were hacked. The true Christian Defense League articles, all of that um, up on our site. So now uh, this is a really amazing time we're in. Okay, um, so praise God. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. It's definitely a, a special time this year, 2023, Feast of Tabernacles. It is a time to go down in history and remember. We're just celebrating it. I hope everybody's just enjoyed this year and are enjoying with their whole family. It is a blessing that it is also a Sunday uh, on our calendar. You know, we're able to uh, be able to spend time with our families today. And I hope everybody's rejoicing with their families. That's what it says we're to do. And I hope people are feasting. And that's that's all part of the feast. And, you know, like it says, not only the, 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 the feast days. So the Israelites in dispersion. Okay, there are the 12 tribes. Only one tribe was ever even called Judah. That word Jew only shows up 30 times in the Old Testament. But the word Israel shows up 2,500 times in the Bible. Okay, that's the Israel people. And a lot of the word, times the word Jew shows up in the Holy Scriptures, it's actually in the negative. It's not saying anything great. But in the, when it shows Israel, those peop, the, the 12 tribes, which are not Judah, 
Now, those are two separate houses, by the way. You call the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Okay, most of the scriptures, um, really, you could never, um, like, um, alternate. You can't just, like, uh, use it synonymous. <laughs> Judah and Israel are two separate houses. It even says, after the new heavens and new earth. So these words are not interchangeable, but people think, oh, Jew is the same as Israel. No, it's not. Those are two separate people. But it says, after the new heavens and new earth, even then, even then, still, Judah is the house of Judah, and Israel is the house of Israel. Two separate peoples, okay? The biggest tribe of Manasseh got the name Israel. That's the biggest tribe. We got the promises, and they're called Manasseh, and they're also called Israel. It says the name Israel was placed upon Manasseh. You could say Ephraim and Manasseh because it's both of them at the same time, they got the, that blessing. Where it says the name Israel was placed on these tribes, and it was a rotating blessing with, with Jacob crossing his arms and saying one will precede the other but will rotate the word is, you know, revolve around each other so that they're actually going to, going to go back and forth. So we have that great promise where the great birthrights you can see are being fulfilled among the Ephraim and Manasseh people, which it says would be going northwest and be a multitude of mighty nations and great and mighty nation as well. And this you can see among the British Commonwealth, the way that the blessings occurred, these islands that it says are northwest, where the kingdom was transplanted in the time of Jeremiah in 500 B.C., uh, Jeremiah transplanted uh, not only the throne of David, but he brought David's harp and the king's daughters. So at that time, Tiatefi uh, married uh, the king of, what is his name, Aokiah, uh, there at uh, Tara Hill, where uh, he was crowned on the stone of scone. Okay, and that stone, well, at that time it was Laophael, uh, yeah, that, that stone was carried through the wilderness, as it says in the scriptures, and that water flowed from it when Moses would strike it, and it fed all the Israelites, okay? And this stone would cry out if uh, you had the right um, heir on the throne. So the, the bloodline of Judah, the both the Zerah and Pharaoh's branches, so those you have what's called, the, I told you about the promises, but the, this um, this birthright of the the throne, the scepter, okay, is it, it says it will not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes, and Shiloh is also something to do with the Northern Kingdom, which there was a rivalry, okay. This uh, this Samaritan Pentateuch even uses a lot more emphasis on the original. So the those scriptures are exactly the same for the whole you know Old Testament portions. But the, only as it talks about one of the temple mounts, it's going to refer to Shiloh's uh, mountain. So, um, rather than Zion. But the rest is all in agreement. So they use the sacred name a lot more. Uh, you know, some longer spelling of the sacred name with extra H in there sometimes. Uh, but, um, and the, it's more authoritative as far as, you know, the Masoretic is what the other... That what the Jews have, but the Samaritan Pentateuch have this version of the uh, the scriptures, uh, the Hebrew scriptures that they've maintained. And well, that anyhow, the 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 scepter itself, just throwing that in free of charge. But the scepter, okay, will not depart from true Judah, and that went 500 B.C. over to the Isles Northwest. So Jeremiah was given all these prophecies, and one of them was that you're going to uproot, plant, and build, or that it's going to be, a, you know, through with him, that Yahweh was going to uproot the kingdom, to throw it down, and to plant and to build. Okay, And that's what's going to happen to the kingdom, as it says, in his day, 500 B.C. So Jeremiah gave the prophecy about that. They didn't like it. They threw him in prison. But then what happened is the king of Babylon came down just like he prophesied and destroyed and laid waste 
uh, the whole Judea, took captive. This is what they do, is they take the people captive and carry them away to Babylon. Okay, And they killed all the king's sons. So only the king's daughters survived. And by the way, the house of Judah was well known where they moved to. Okay, there was, So there are two branches of Judah because there are two twins that were born. Okay, there was Zara and Pharez. Pharez stayed in Jerusalem, in the you know in, the, in Judea, but the um, Zara branch founded all the the Greek nobility. Okay, Norse nobility, uh, Spain, Ireland, all that. Okay, uh, Sparta and all that stuff you know of. Okay, um, and founded. Uh, these lines, and one of the lines of, of Troy, as well as that was the Latin branch of Rome, the royal house with Brutus, who later founded the Britain, okay, as Bart, Sparta broke up and went their different ways as well. Um, and so this is really interesting because it's listed in the scriptures as well. It lists the genealogy. It talks about Darda and Dardas, the sons, the grandsons of Judah, of the Zarda branch, okay, in the Holy Scriptures. And it says that Solomon was wiser than those grand, great-grandchildren of Judah, which, you know, like I say, it lists out the genealogy. So, uh, down, now down all the way across, you got this relocation going on, right? So that's what happened is the um, Jeremiah brought the king's daughters, the king of Judah of the Pharaoh's branch, and he united the Zara branch. They married and he was crowned king. And so the, the kingdom did transplant. The scripture stayed fulfilled, which said that there will not fail to be in any generation a descendant of King David on the throne. He did say that It'll get, you know, like the, the people get um, kind of overthrown as long as they rebel and they'll be in a state of like, well, like Ireland, they're mostly all drunks. Right? They're in a state of not the supreme rule that Israel would have. But like they say, if they weren't, if it wasn't for alcohol, Ireland would rule the world. Everybody knows and calls Ireland sons of Abraham, oh, actually they call him the sons of Aaron, okay? Everybody in Ireland is called the son of Aaron. And you can't join their largest social groups called the Orange Order. You can't even join unless you, the one rule you have to be is, well, you have to be a Christian, but then you also have to believe that all, so part of the membership, you got to believe that the Irish are the tribe of Levi, okay? So you really have this strong whole situation there and uh, they did so what happened was Jeremiah the, the high priest the prophet brought the priesthood there okay and it says he brought Baruch his scribe with him okay and so Iarbanel so, so they wrote his name Iarbanel in the annals okay and brought that all that with him and transplanted the kingdom just like the scripture said he would Otherwise, you have the other side, of it if you want to say, oh, okay, well, then the, the throne just all disappeared for 500 years till Christ returned and say, okay, somehow like that, but actually it didn't. So, and it says that it will not depart from Judah. Every generation, there's going to continue to be a descendant on the throne. So the, the throne then moved to Scotland, and then eventually Edward Longshanks took it. And the scriptures also say there'd be three overturns of that throne. And so it moved the first time as it moved to Ireland, second time it moved to Scotland, and the third time it moved to England. Three different kingdoms. Okay, so now at this stage, uh, it says it's going to stick with Judah until Shiloh comes. Okay, and a lot of people believe that Shiloh would represent Christ, and Christ comes because there's scripture about that as well, that he's going to wait until Shiloh comes. So that means once they restore uh, the priesthood, of the northern kingdom, okay, because that's where um, the the northern tribes of Israel kept 
uh, and also later the um, so these were the ones who were kicked out of the main uh, Judah, you know, the outcasts of Israel, but they did maintain the scriptures. They did maintain the traditions. You know, just like when Christ came to the woman at the well and she said, our fathers worship at this mountain here. And she was pointing to it. It's not, and that one was not the mountain of um, Zion, but the, or, or where the, the temple mount is today, but that was the other mountain, okay? Some would say it's Gibeon and other places like this. So that was called the great high place where um, Saul went to go get anointed. And that's where Samuel kept the Ark of the Covenant and so forth. And that's where it rested for a long time before they prepared the site where it is now. Okay, where it moved next, I should say. Some want to say it's down there below the ground somewhere like you can believe where you want it to, you want it to go some say well, that ark of the covenant was moved um and did not return since the 500 bc there are all different theories including um records of jeremiah bringing the ark of the covenant to america up there some believe it would be in mount nebo uh but in that's in that case those are theories harder to prove but um, we'll see one day. Uh, but the throne itself, that's what's key. And the tares are going to be gathered together and burned. Okay, that's what happens first before his people get gathered into the barn. So praise him that we're starting to see the wicked. It says it'll happen there at Armageddon. Okay, this is the day of fire today. This is the day of tabernacles. He's tabernacling among his people. We are in the body of Christ, Mashiach, Yeshua. We are part of his body, it says. And this is a very universal teaching in any church in the world. You take of his body, you're, you are one with him. And he that's joined to Yahweh is one spirit. You have it. Maybe we go to sleep sometimes, but we got to wake up out of our stupor. Okay? We got to start activating our spirit and doing what his word says. Every morning we should be doing the Shema. You know, Christ, when he was told or asked, I should say, what is the greatest commandment? You know what he said? Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. That's what he said. Okay? So you need to know those words. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, your Lord God is one. All right? Why do I say do that? It's because it continues on. That's from Deuteronomy and it's, it's telling us, you shall love, and it continues on, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, and it says, and let these matters I command you this day be upon your heart. Teach them thoroughly to your children. Speak of them when you sit in your home. Okay, so that's talking about you take the scriptures that you're going to study this day. God's given you a message for today. It says, so God's going to command you today uh, some verses to study. And it's saying, okay, speak of them when you sit in your home, when you walk on the way. Okay, and it goes on down the list. So you're going to talk about these commandments. It says you're going to teach these commandments thoroughly to your children. So you recite this in the morning to remind yourself. We really recommend it, because if he said that's the greatest commandment, I think we should be saying it, as well as the Lord's Prayer. Get yourself on track. Start your day right. It says this day's daily bread in that prayer. The Lord's Prayer is for daily usage, even more than once a day, because really you start the day in the morning, but in the Hebrew sense, you also start the day when the sun goes down. So do it when you like when it says, when you lie down, when you rise up. That's what it says. So the Shema is talking about reciting. So you can Google it anywhere. You can also get it off our website, orthodoxchurch.nl, the Shema. You can print a nice version, put it in your prayer closet, your nice family area where you have a, a special prayer time, where you keep your Bibles and prayer books, where you can then gather together in that corner and pray. you got to have a prayer corner. Set one up if you don't have one, and just have a nice prayer spot. And, you know... Get together right there and just, you can print the Shema, a really nice artistic one. 
you can put, you know, frame it and put it up on the wall or whatnot. And it's real nice to just remind everybody the greatest commandment from Christ to remind us this day, talk about his commandments. Okay, so if you start your day out right, you're going to do it every single day. It's not just for Sundays. Okay, yeah, and the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. So how many days daily bread? This day, this day's daily bread. So you have a double confirmation that it's for daily in this day's daily. So it's talking about you're going to continue using it every day. Okay, this is the way the Lord gave us to pray. All right, so that's awesome uh, way to start the day, but then get the scriptures out, get the Psalms. You have 150 psalms. You're supposed to go through them every month. If you're monastic and in an order, you typically go them through in a whole day. But the basic, um, most accepted way of doing the psalms is do a few every day. So you go through all 150. And you can get in the prayer book, and they're, they're broken up by day of the month. You got day one. You got the psalms like... You got the morning service, you got the evening service. So go through them and just be encouraged and pray them with, with understanding because when we pray in agreement, and let's say we're all doing the same psalm, that's why it's good to do while well, you have the psalms numbered is because then you're praying the same prayer together. And if you use the prayer book, you're praying such strong kingdom prayers. We use the British, you know, English Book of Common Prayer. It is based on the older Celtic liturgies. It is a great um, succession of the ancient English Orthodox liturgies, which go back to the Celtic, the Gallican rite, and it's just really um, the best you can get. I think you'll be really blessed if you're in an English-speaking congregation, of course, but also you can get it in other languages. Uh, the, the Book of Common Prayer is translated in, into hundreds of languages. Uh, I was down at the, where was it, um, who, uh, the name of the uh, museum, where they have hundreds of different, uh, different copies of the English Book of Common Prayer, and I think it's over a hundred languages right there, housed there. Um, uh, it's where they have the Pilgrim's Progress, the the um, location there, um, the Pilgrim's Progress Museum. Okay, so um, this is just really a, a great thing to know that, look, we have a strong liturgy. We also have a lot promoting it. We have more and more articles coming up. So you know and have confidence to, in your home, to do... The Book of Common Prayer. You can even look at the liberal Anglicans. They even do it, you know. So if you're going to be a big conservative, I, I would think you want to pray more, right? Not less. If the liberals are out doing you, you know, that shows something. We got to just at least remember daily. I know any kind of, any background of Christian, if you pray more there, say that's better, okay? So if you got more reasons to pray, that's great. Well, you know that the Bible says there's hours of prayer. So we have hours of prayer. Wow. And you also have hours of incense. Did you know that's in the New Testament? Yes, it is. Hours of the hour of prayer. You got the third hour of prayer. You got the sixth hour. You know, you got all the different hours all in the scriptures. Okay. First hour of prayer is the sunrise. That's normally the biggest one. Then you got noon. Okay, then you got sun, sunset, and the Book of Common Prayer combines them so that you don't have to um, go do all the different hours. You have two prayer times. You have morning and evening, and yeah, it combines a lot of those, so like, it's with grace, so you might pick up with it at your own pace. So let's say you get up at 9, then you can still catch along, even though the sun rose at 7. But you have the option of doing both, so you can actually get on at 7, Start your day out right before the sun comes up, or this says in the scriptures, before the day star does arise. You're going to, it's just, it's a, a good thing to start it out early before the sun rises. 
And then God will empower you that day in a special way. Okay, so praise be to his holy name. He has these tools. And there are a lot of scriptures about it. We're going to launch an article about the rising early. Okay, um, and if you're interested in this, we can prioritize it. Okay, so then you have the evening service. So you can do it at your, at your time as well. Or do it at bedtime with your family. Like it says, um, when you lie down and when you rise up. So you do your Shema also before bedtime. Okay, it's not legalistic. You don't have to do it this way. Okay, um, but it's a blessing. It really is. As much as you can adapt and that works in your home, it'll be really a blessing for you. Uh, so I'm just looking forward to see what God will do and seeing more and more of his word fulfilled as we understand his feasts, as we understand how he fulfills them, we know how things will unfold in time and how um, we are going to celebrate his kingdom on earth for 1,000 years. And you know what that means. What we're celebrating, the Tabernacles is actually when we're going to be celebrating the fulfillment one day when Christ returns. And that will be when he's king of kings and lord of lords, every knee does bow. There is no more sin in the whole world, okay? It says that Satan will be bound for 1,000 years, that there's no more evil, there's no more death, there's no more crying, okay? There's no sin. And you have that, you know, time of rejoicing, because this is the feast of rejoicing. You do it for one week, you have your best food. It says you have you spend the money in the area you believe God is placing his name. It says you you celebrate with your whole household and, and eat the best food you love together and just rejoice. Okay? And just be happy and dance and, and celebrate. Okay. And you're celebrating Christ most of all, because this is celebrating because he was born on tabernacles. It says he tabernacled among us when he was born. Okay, the, the word for tabernacles about his birth. And so forth. There's a lot of uh, study behind that on the actual date of his birth. Um, but it's celebrating his coming into the world. And that, um, but now it will be final fulfilled at his second coming. When finally, so you're going to first have the Feast of Trumpets. That's when we all get our resurrected bodies. We all gather together with him in the air, it says. And the dead in Christ rise first and you know, at the, at the last trump, at the great trump, we're going to all resurrect. And we're going to get our glorified bodies. And at that time, okay, then we're going to be up there with them. It says there'll be ten days. It's called the ten days of awe. Where people are going to get a chance to repent. And there's going to be stuff hitting the earth. And it's going to be a, a, a wild time. And people are going to have to choose during those ten days. Because then what was called the day of atonement is called the great day of Yahweh. And it's called the, the great and terrible day of the Lord, where he unleashes whoever rejected Christ as their Savior, who is their blood substitute. Because Adam kind uh, is, is born in a fallen condition, if people haven't noticed. We are all born, and we can see the world is corrupt. Everybody knows that. And we all know we need a Savior. Well, Christ, Yeshua, is the only way that we can be saved. It's all through him and through his order and through his kingdom, the way he set up things. So we either love him and love his laws, his order, his kingdom, because kingdom is always laws. And the laws are for the earth. And it says when he, it's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ where his law is the constitution of the whole world. And then it says the devil will be led out again for a little while. So we're going to see this time of, of great uh, blessing upon the whole world. And that's what we're celebrating now. Is it's called a rehearsal. So all the feasts are rehearsals. The word in Hebrew is mikra, okay? And it has to do with the rehearsal. Kind of like when you have a dress rehearsal for a wedding. That's what we're doing. We're practicing what's going to happen. And we're celebrating it for the one week. But it's going to be as the thousand-year reign. And so 
Yes, uh, so leading up you have atonement, right? So I was talking about the great and terrible day, which leads up 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets. Once that gets fulfilled, okay, then atonement is going to wipe out all the opposition. So um, then we come in great glory with all the saints, okay, and do war. And that day of atonement is that's it. It's all over. The end. And I believe in that day, whoever had not received Christ in those days, they're going to be pretty wicked and corrupt and evil. They're chosen as vessels of his wrath from the foundation of the earth. They were already chosen to be destroyed there um, because those who are called, it says no one can resist him. So he makes sure that he doesn't lose any. He says no one can come unto me unless the Father calls him. And those whom the Father hath given me, no man can take him out of my Father's hand. So it's saying, look, um, he can't lose. He, we're not to be afraid that someone could lose their salvation. Yeah, sure, we love everyone, and we're going to be kind to everyone, of course. But you can't lose your salvation based on other people and other things. Now, you know, the way that election works, so it's called predestination and election and, and also being chosen. And not only being chosen, because it says many are called, but few are chosen. A lot of people are going to go to heaven and find they didn't overcome. And it says only they who overcome get their throne. There's a throne up there with our name on it. So there's different levels of rewards people might have optionally been able to take where they gave up and they couldn't get it, where they only had to celebrate. It was just a very small thing to just trust him, yield to him. It's very simple. We don't have to uh, do all these strong, powerful things. We just have to yield typically. So uh, it's just a great and glorious day today, this Tabernacles a time where we can just celebrate and know that he is doing something great in the earth. Okay, we all have good news to celebrate, not just the, the bad things that happen in the world, but there's good. And that's what we're to do today, is we're to know that he's called out his people to be separate. He said, come ye out from among them and be ye separate. Uh, you know, it says, touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. This is New Testament, by the way. And it says, they who are going to be um, of his people, we got to be careful who we bless, too. It says that if you bid Godspeed to someone who's an evildoer, not to, be, not to bid Godspeed to them, because you can be partakers of their evil deeds. And it also says not to eat or not to accept them into your home, those who are various kinds of different evildoers. One of the things on the list is that there's a lot of things in the list that you won't get into the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Um, and we can pick out a lot of different ones. I probably shouldn't do that. Um, don't want to offend anyone, but there are quite a few things in there. And we do have to realize what kind of people we're going to invite in our home. And actually, it says they're to have believers, not... And it says, do good to the household of faith. Sure, we're going to do good to all the other people out there, but they got to repent. You know, a drunkard, for example, not saying everybody who has wine once in the year or something like this, that they're a drunkard, but it says no drunkard will enter the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, and no brawler, uh, if they're just brawling all the time, doesn't mean you might make a mistake once in a year and you repent. Um, but uh, you're, you're trying your best not to do those sins. Sexual immorality, all the different things. Repenting if you fell, you fell and made a mistake. And he forgives you. He wants to forgive you. He's ready to forgive each and every person. We just confess and we get back on the track. When you fall down in the dirt and you're in a race... To win, right? You don't just stay face down in the dirt. You get up. So that's what I want everybody to do is get up. We got to get back in the race, every single one of us. I think there is a lot going on that that if just more of his church, more of his people will get busy in it, we'll see some great things happening in our local communities, in our areas, in our state, and in our nation. Just being blessed going forward in great victory because 
seeking first his kingdom on earth. That's what we're t told to do. And only when you seek first his kingdom, that's his law. And you come out from among them, you be separate. You get the freedom in your area to keep the commandments, okay, which are right now the most persecuted thing. You can't keep any of the laws uh, these days unless you're really not offending anyone, right? <laughs> so the only way you could do that is if you're in like a real great area where that it is not concentrated with atheists. Sure, there might be atheists here and there, and that's all fine, you know, um, but biblical is going to be more of a zone where it's like it says, that every man with his ten acres, and every man under his own fig tree, and drinking water out of his own cistern, and all that. That's what God intended, and it's just for basics. It's not for like, oh, pre preparation, you know, no, our ancestors have always had um, the basics of just having a place for your houses and you just have a little area where you grow some food. That's normal. So that's what God has for everyone. Let's just say you like certain kind of fruit, so you grow it on your land. And it doesn't even, you can't even buy that certain fruit in uh, anywhere. So it's no big deal to just get your land and grow what you like. That's part of freedom. All right, so uh, there's a lot of land. And right now, with the 2030-30 plan, they're wanting to give 30% of that land to be protected. So I think land will become more scarce uh, with the coming clampdowns, including the digital currency they're wanting to put everybody in so get in a state that's not so liberal if you got to move you got to move get in a land get in an area that you can buy land okay that's not being all absorbed into that uh 30 percent government land protected land where people can't do anything with it um and get to an area that's more free um free to worship our god without being harassed okay all of the Bible's political. Every verse in the Bible is political, and it's going to put you in one camp or the other. There's going to be no on the fence when he returns. When he comes with trumpets and Armageddon, look, there's there's seven resurrections. So that only counts one of them. Okay. You're going to... You don't want to miss the resurrection. Okay. Um, and it says you'll have to sleep for a thousand years. That you're not going to be part of that great wedding supper you're going to wait until the the throne of judgment and a thousand years later that's just for whoever didn't overcome because he's only coming for the first fruits the rest have to sleep for one thousand years in the earth okay so really we have a situation we got to repent he doesn't want the lukewarm okay he says that the lukewarm he's going to spit him out of his mouth you got to be hot or cold. You're in one camp or the other. It says it's going to be kingdom of light against the kingdom of darkness. And the only way we can make it through is just simply have freedom. Know where you live. Be in harmony where you the people. We do have a lot of church and Christian people. But if you're just mixed in a zone where it's just hostile towards basic traditional loving peaceful christianity then we got to look at an area where it's not so hostile it's just normal all right if you don't provide for your own it says you're worse than an infidel and you've just denied the faith okay we got to provide for our own and says do good to all men but most especially to them who are of the household of faith okay so we have these big things it even says not to go to the other tribes it's, Christ said, go not, enter not into any of the cities of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says, my sheep hear my voice. They know the shepherd. There are those of other tribes who don't hear his voice. They don't know the shepherd. And also, if you're just marrying outside of your tribe, he says, that's a problem too. It could be. Not always. If they've been in, a, in your same country for a couple generations, their ancestors, say their grandparents immigrated, they already integrated, fine, then you're speaking pretty much the same tongue and everything. Okay. 
So you're not going to have as much conflict. That's just normal. But in the Bible, it says there's only going to be one tribe in each zone in the kingdom. Okay? And there's also only one tribe of each of the 12 tribes. One name over each gate. And they're going to go in. It says 12,000 of this tribe, 12,000 of that tribe, like this. <coughs> All separately. And so... You can go through the original there and see how many, if it's going to be millions or thousands. That's, a, that's another topic. But it's really important to really know that we can't be lukewarm, but also that our tribe has to be strong. He wants, he's only coming back for this church that's without spot or wrinkle, he said. And it says, the bride hath made herself ready. Okay? It's not all just do nothing. Um, but it's preparing. And it says that the his name will be praised from the West and people will fear his name from the West. And that our people will, um, um, what is the next? Be a witness of the kingdom before the end does come. Okay. We'll be a witness of the kingdom. This is what Christ said. That means his law, his government for nations. Actually, did you know that 80% of the laws in the Bible are only national level applicable? They're not even personally applicable. It's for a whole, a whole system, a whole government. And they're all embedded in, in Western Christian nations. Okay? And we have seen all of our public laws become, like, attacked. It used to be segregation was totally normal till the 1970s um, and 80s, you know, because everybody in the 60s, through the whole 1960s, it was a, still a felony to do interracial marriage all the way to 1968 in most of the states in America, okay, to Loving versus Virginia in 1967. And that was all overturned with the Roe v. Wade overturn. That's why in December 2022, they had to pass a law that said, and they did, they passed a law that says no church is going to be discriminated against if they don't recognize the interracial marriage, but state level has to recognize interracial marriages. This is what it says. It's called the Respect for Marriage Act, and it also includes same-sex marriages. Because when that Roe v. Wade thing was over, overturned, all of a sudden all these marriages were were no longer legal basically that's what the that's what they were arguing that's why they said they need to pass this law so now they can't do that so that's i'm just saying it was the norm look i'm not saying anybody needs to go around invalidating anything i'm just saying is that it was the norm segregation was the norm the public law is embedded for god's god's laws it even says in god's laws that if you marry among your own israelites even just another tribe of the Israelites, that even though there you're going to not be allowed to have inheritance, or not the main inheritance, at least, of your family. Why is that? Because in that land, it's going to be only one tribe. All your neighbors are the same tribe. For example, the tribe of Benjamin or the tribe of Levi. Well, Levi doesn't really get land. They stay around the, the tabernacle. Or all the other tribes, Asher, Naphtali, Reuben, each one in their own zone with their own land. And it goes down. So after maybe the second generation, and let's say one of your brothers or sisters didn't have enough children, yeah, you can start to, your own descendants can start to give back some of their land as they marry back into your original tribe. And like that. So it does work its, its way back. But there is a time where, look, so God loves separatism it's a blessing and it's a love for exp for allowing the uniqueness of each one to continue i mean you know how strange french people are right <laughs> they really are i don't know if you've been to france but if you just force them to marry irishmen where you just say okay all the irish let's say french people aren't allowed to marry anything but irish right they're both israel tribes right uh, France is the tribe of Reuben, and some of the, the German, Germanic as well in there, but most, for the most part, 
it's a the romance country of of Reuben. Okay, fulfills all the things that the tribe of Reuben would do in the end times and all the distinctive features. Okay, <laughs> and uh, how they would be first of among the nations and do all these things and all this. They fulfilled all of it to the T. Um, among the brethren of the tribes of Israel. And so imagine that. I mean, they're just so different. Um, they're not hugely different. If you want to go really hugely different, there are some other... So you might have a province in France that can be more one tribe, let's say like the Normans. Normandy, that was the, the Danes who took Normandy and started ruling some part of France. And it's really like it says that Dan would be a, a ruler um, between uh, the tribe, you know, at the th throne supporting the true Judah throne. So you have always Judah is among all the other tribes. So in the Judah branch, you can find the genealogies. They rule on the throne. Like it says, that's the anointing that Judah has, that they are the ruler tribe. And among them, you had sometimes Dan is the supporter of the Judah, so Dan or Denmark, and then you have the broader tribe there. So Reuben had is the broader tribe of France. Okay, but overall, the romantic people of France, I tell you, they would be destroyed. That really would 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 tear them down if they were, you know, let's say all just forced to intermarry um, some other foreign tribe, right? It would just bring them into a whole other reality. And it would weaken them. They wouldn't be who they were. There is no strength in diversity. Or, you know, maybe if they keep their own uniqueness, it's strong. But when you mix it out of existence, where it's no longer recognizable... What's that? That's that's fascism to say, don't be your uniqueness. That's the true fascism. Okay? When you're separate, that is non-fascist. Okay? It is love and preservation and, and expression and liberty. Okay? That's what God wants. He wants love, not hating your heritage. Actually, Esau hated his heritage, and it says that's why God will never forgive him, even though he sought it with tears, and to the end of time, he will lay his heritage waste to the dragons and punish him. And it says that one day he's going to punish them all the way. The whole tribe is going to continue being punished because Esau sold, he despised his birthright and sold his birthright for a cup of soup. That was his sin. And yeah, that he mixed too, but the main sin was that he just said it wasn't worth it. He didn't want it. Okay? And he, yeah, for, married the forbidden wives, as his family all said, you can only, and Yahweh said, only of your own lineage, only of your own house. And this is before the law of Moses. Way before the law of Moses. Also Noah, it says, was perfect in his tail of dud, genealogy. And that all his family were the only ones pure on the whole earth. They were, they were, you know, perfect in their manners. It says they're perfect in their genealogy. Okay. They were still imperfect as far as being in fallen man, but they were actually the only ones who didn't mix with the fallen angels and all the other things it says they're mixing with. It says that they went after foreign flesh in Sodom and Gomorrah as well. It says that was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not only just the sodomy, but it says they went after foreign flesh. Flesh of another kind of some sort. Okay? So all that mixing is not what God wants. He wants us to be strong and proud of who we are in Him. Sure, people might make a mistake. Okay? There's grace. There's restoration. There might be even, towards the end of someone's life, even different because they're not reproducing children. There's different kinds of graces. Um, but we can't teach children that they should mix. they got to learn to be with their own kind. That's normal. So God will bless it that we just continue on how we have in every generation. But he's not going to bless 
He just won't bless the mixing. It's just not going to happen. He says, every tree which my father didn't plant will be uprooted at that time when uh, atonement happens. And there are, you know, situations where he, in grace, he doesn't want his people to be destroyed, so he might, in grace, just allow different lions to go extinct here and there. He does it, not us. So if you want to be in the blessings and the flourishings, be with his kingdom, as it says. When we seek first his kingdom, we have this wonderful promise. I'm going to tell you it. If you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. That's referring to like all the, the necessities of life. And it was talking about, you know, not to be worried about any of the, any of the things you might need. And that God provides. He is our shepherd. But it says, when you seek first, that means above everything else, his kingdom and his righteousness, then all those necessities of life. And that's not just ta- life is talking about anything financial. It's talking about for thriving, not just surviving, but thriving, okay? Life means to thrive, to peak, to fullness, okay, of the best uh, of your situation in life, of all the things that you could have. So it's really pretty awesome. And really, it's great to share this all with you. I hope this uh, Bible study has been a a great uh, supplement to your local Bible studies out there. Orthodox Church of the Chaldees. Yes, our order is uh, at this stage like uh, just a small over at some churches we meet at. The, you know, we may have seven members, something like this here and there, teaching groups that, that meet together. And that's it. And, you know, we're not a huge church. We are supplemental. We're a teaching ministry. And that's all as it has been for the Celts, okay? We have only been uh, prophets and evangelists, okay? That's what we've been known as, not as pastors, which are just leading one local flock. But Coldies and the Celts have been major leaders at national levels and have been very influential in politics and have routed kings, routed princes, Uh, stood in the gap like it says that the Zadok priesthood would do. Okay, Melech, Zadok, or royal priesthood, it says we are 1 Peter 2.9. Royal priesthood is the word Melchizedek. You are Melchizedek. You are a Melech, Zadok, royal priest. Okay, a holy nation called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Okay, you're a chosen generation. Okay, called out. You're his royal priesthood. Again, that word for generation there, chosen, is the word for genealogy. And yes, the Zadok priests are descendants of Aaron. This It says it, they're descendants of Aaron. I believe it. That settles it. That's what it is. And it says, among the descendants of Aaron, they have that anointing of prophet. If you look at the Celts, independent structure, wherever they have been, Glastonbury, all across the British Isles, Scotland, you know, Columbanus, who who spread it in the early stages of the Northwestern churches and monasticism, which later got taken over by the Benedictines. But at the first stages, it was all the Irish schools of the Coldies. Okay? And we're descendant with bloodline to these houses. And so that's how it works. Sons of the prophets is the word there. Okay, it does say one of the, it says the top of the list. What is God using for the perfecting of the saints? Pastors is down at the bottom of the list. Bishops is also, it's only city administrator. It's a secular job, typically. But okay, you can mix them. You can mix them with um, teacher. You can mix them with uh, evangelist. You can mix them with apostle. But it says all these other offices, apostle, prophet. First one on the list is prophets. Prophets and apostles would pick typically who was going to be the priest. Uh, the special prayer and so forth that would be going into it. And picking um, 
the priests. So that's how it happened. Even sometimes, like Paul the Apostle, who uh, one of his co-apostles had a disagreement with him about who was going to get brought into the priesthood next. And they went their separate ways, but they did still get anointed to lay the foundations of the early first century church. And uh, we have all these wonderful things. But it says that these offices are for the perfecting of the saints. It doesn't say it's for finding the lost and just getting new people in and getting the, the people who are flaky and wishy-washy. No. Um, yes, it's important to have a physician. And we all need a physician. It says pray for all the saints continually. It doesn't say pray for all the non-believers continually. And the word for saint is the word for separate. Okay. Uh, that's another thing. It says be holy. Now, the word is for be separate. So that's part of what the Goldies are. The Celtic Church is separate and independent. And this has been a great strength for us. Our sovereignty maintained in our own church jurisdictions. And it's an awesome thing to have and to celebrate. So anyhow, I do pray that this has been a very great blessing. This tabernacle's for you. Take care, and we're looking forward to next Sabbath to do another message for you. Take care, and may Yahweh bless you.